Before I'm a professor here at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and it's a pleasure to convene, and I won't do much more than that, to convene this discussion of the political and economic uh, implications of the Palestinian fiscal crisis. Uh, this is a real pleasure for me uh, because I am also a scholar at the Middle East Institute uh, to welcome Ms. Vice President Casey. Thank you, Dan. And I want to thank our uh, esteemed panelists and moderator uh, for joining us today. Uh, we're looking forward to their views and insights. I think last night's presidential debate underscored the, the sad truth uh, in this town that there uh, is not much of a, well, there's no Palestinian-Israeli peace process going on, and we know some right now to pursue one. And for those of you who watched the baseball game and said, I believe there was one reference uh, to the peace process, and that was raised by the candidate uh, who was on the record saying that uh, with regard to the peace process, he would kick that ball down the field. So I'm hoping that uh, today's discussion uh, will at least uh, shine a bit of a spotlight on an issue uh, that has uh, been buried the last couple of, of months. And I'm delighted that we're going to have this um, discussion, which comes on the heels of, of protests and, and discontent with the Abbas administration uh, due to the financial problems uh, in the PA. I want to thank the George and Rhonda Salem Family Foundation for making uh, this event possible. Uh, they have been sponsoring a series of panels on the Palestinian situation uh, here at MEI. And as part of that series last week, we hosted the great Palestinian scholar uh, Walid Khalidi, born in Jerusalem in 1925, who uh, imparted uh, real pearls uh, of wisdom. And if you were not able to make that, I would suggest you catch that online at uh, mei.edu. Uh, we'll have a transcript up as well soon. And I want to thank SITES uh, as well for making, um, and the conflict management program for making this room possible. Uh, finally, I want to note that we have our annual conference and banquet coming up November 13th and 14th, uh, right after the election. I'm not sure what kind of mood everybody will be in, but I'm sure we'll all be looking for distraction. So please come join us. Our, our conference is free and open to the public. Uh, we'll be examining uh, the regional implications of the Syria uh, crisis. We'll be looking at the challenges in Egypt. We'll be talking about Iran and uh, the question of uh, U.S. policy uh, in the region. And now I'd like to turn back to today's uh, program. When I began thinking about this topic, I reached out to a dear acquaintance for his advice, Hussein uh, Ibish, uh, who has been uh, working on this issue from uh, all of its various angles. He's well known for uh, the work he's done as a senior fellow at the American Task Force on uh, Palestine, an NGO that advocates that it is in the American national interest to promote an end. Uh, to uh, the conflict in the Middle East with a two-state solution. He's also the executive director of the Halak Alam Maksud Foundation and writes for the Daily Star and the Daily Peace slash Open Zion blog. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him here with us today. And Hussein, I'd like to hand the panel now over to you. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the technical and political implications of the uh, fiscal crisis facing the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Society in the West Bank. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm first going to begin uh, by introducing our uh, panel, and then I'm going to give a very brief sort of set of framing remarks, and, and we'll begin. We'll have about 15 minutes from each of our distinguished panelists, uh, and then we'll uh, turn to you for um, Q&A. So um, to, we'll begin furthest to my left, uh, literally, but not necessarily metaphorically, with uh, Osama Kanan, who is the, uh, it, it, at the moment and following a very distinguished career. And by the way, if you're interested, uh, you've got handouts with the full bios of all of our uh, uh, panelists, and anyone watching on C-SPAN can certainly look it up online. It's readily available. But uh, after a very long and distinguished career, uh, Osama Kanan is now the International Monetary Fund's uh, mission chief for the West Bank and Gaza and for Syria. He was previously the IMF resident representative in Jerusalem, among many other uh, distinguished positions. Uh, next to him, and he will go second, is Khadr Gindi, who is a fellow at the Saban Center uh, for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Uh, between 2004 and 2009, Mr. Gindi served with the Negotiation Support Unit in Ramallah as an advisor uh, to the Palestinian leadership on permanent status negotiations with Israel. 
And finally, immediately uh, to my left here, uh, is Robert Denin, who is the Eni Enrico Mate Senior Fellow for uh, Middle East and African Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He headed, after a long career and very distinguished career in the State Department, uh, the uh, Jerusalem mission for the Quartet Representative Tony Blair from April 2008 until August 2010. Uh, and so uh, that's the panel. Uh, now what we're going to be looking at today is a, uh, a problem that is ongoing, very relevant, and under-analyzed and under-discussed, at least in, in, in the political register here in Washington, sort of ignored. Uh, and what it really is is a deep-seated financial and even, in a way, governance crisis in the, in the uh, areas under the Palestinian Authority control in Palestinian society in the West Bank. The PA budget requires approximately $1 billion in external funding uh, every year. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, during 2012, the PA has found itself in a grave and ongoing unfolding fiscal crisis to the extent that uh, the Palestinian government finds itself uh, unable to meet payroll in a timely fashion, upon which a huge percentage of the Palestinian population, both in the West Bank and in Gaza, because it must not be forgotten, the PA in Ramallah pays most of the public sector employee uh, salaries in the Gaza Strip, as well as in the West Bank, depend. And also, there is, of course, the, uh, the overflow from that into the rest of the economy as people spend, or in, as it has been in recent months, don't spend the wages that they haven't received, same with their families. Um, this problem probably began to, to fester in most in earnest uh, after the failed Palestinian UN bid uh, at uh, the September 2011 UN meeting, which caused a, a, a diplomatic crisis with the donor community, particularly the United States, but also to some extent with the European Union, and, and that's continuing uh, to this day with the Palestinians uh, announcing that they intend uh, sometime later in November to seek potentially a, uh, a vote in the UN General Assembly for uh, non-member observer state status, a much less ambitious goal than the failed full member state bid from last year, but still one that, that is prompting uh, an angry response uh, here in Washington and in some other quarters. There are other um, aspects to this crisis as well. Uh, the difficulty of having a timely and regular transfer of, of, of Palestinian tax revenues uh, collected by Israel uh, from Israel to the PA, uh, Arab states that are pledging but not fulfilling on their pledges, and uh, many of the failings uh, of the Palestinians' own economic planning that have been detailed in reports by the IMF, by the World Bank, and others, uh, particularly as regards the, the uh, necessary elements for the creation of a robust and growing private sector, as opposed to a continued reliance on the public sector. Uh, that's my sense of where we are. Uh, and uh, if I've made any mistakes, I'm sure that uh, the panel will correct me. But let's begin with uh, a, an overview from the individual who I think uh, knows more about these, this subject uh, technically than anybody else in the United States, and quite possibly anybody else in the world, Mr. Kanan. Thank you, Hussein. I think uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration. I think what we will do, uh, just to make things simpler, is when you say, instead of saying technical, we say economic, and I will leave the political aspects to my two colleagues. I think the, the one uh, difficult uh, part of you know, presenting uh, an assessment of the situation in the West Bank in Gaza is that you know, one has to be always careful uh, about um, uh, you know, the nuances in the political area. Uh, so what I will do is, as I'm going along, I will put on, your, on, on my two colleagues' plate some of the more controversial uh, uh, issues, uh, mainly non-economic, um, although I'm sure you will have a lot more uh, insight to even the, the economic area. Um, so if I think you um, did a very, uh, you, you had a very good, or presented a very good overview of the situation uh, in, in the West Bank and Gaza, and I think uh, today these issues 
have not been focused on have not been focused on enough. And I'm grateful for the Middle East Institute to have really hosted uh, this panel because you know, one one of the many questions I receive every day is, well, how come there's no no discussion of the uh, serious problems in, 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 in West Bank and Gaza? Uh, we hear a lot about the Arab Spring countries, and you know, rightly mentioned. Okay, the uh, yesterday's debate was barely a mention of the uh, uh, serious problems that are being encountered by uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, uh, there was some discussion of the Palestine-Israel conflict in general uh, that was really slightly touched upon in previous uh, occasions by, by some of the candidates, but really no serious. So I'm glad that at least we uh, and this panel will have an opportunity to uh, uh, to have uh, a discussion uh, of both economic and political aspects. Um, one of the I mean, there is a question that comes up often uh, in my discussions with ordinary people here, the, uh, the just ordinary um, uh, readers or those who are interested in the Palestinian uh, issue is. Well, how come, since so little is, is needed by the PA uh, to pay its wages and salaries, how come no donor is coming forward to actually contribute? Uh, there is now, as Hussein has, uh, has mentioned, a, a serious fiscal crisis in which the PA is not able to pay its wages and salaries. And therefore, there's a real risk of the, the PA uh, and ending up with uh, a serious, not only economic crisis, but political crisis. It will not be able to operate, cover its essential expenditures. It had been able to pay so far for this, for the previous month, half of the uh, wage bill, and still uh, there's no clear um, uh, way out, and, and there's, there's no clear report of action regarding how it will be able to pay the remainder of the wages and salaries. There are strikes, uh, there's, there's, uh, there are social tensions, there are protests, and yet very few people are even mentioning this, are even discussing this uh, in the, at the high level uh, in the state, in the European Union, other countries that are Arab countries even, that usually are very much interested in supporting uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, in this transitional phase uh, towards statehood. Uh, recently there was a uh, meeting in New York of donors. Uh, it is called the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee, Robert, you were, you were there. Um, basically the purpose of that meeting was to, take stock, uh, was to take stock of the situation and try to see what can be done to have the Palestinian authority. Now, the interesting aspect of that meeting uh, was that there was a consensus that the Palestinian Authority uh, built institutions, uh, the IMF staff again reiterated that the Palestinian Authority uh, is ready to conduct the sound economic policy expected of a future Palestinian state. Um, there was a consensus that uh, Good governance has been established, the public management financial system has been strengthened. Um, and yet, in terms of pledges, only I think France pledged uh, 10 million euros. The, the gap right now for the Palestinian Authority is about $400 million out of a total recurrent deficit of $1.3 billion. And that assumes that the amount withheld by Congress from the uh, United States, which is about $200 million, will be paid. So in fact, if there's any uncertainty with regard to that uh, withheld amount, the gap would rise to $600 million out of the $1.3 billion uh, uh, recurrent deficit. Still, this amount actually, when you compare it to the amounts given to other countries, neighboring countries, in general with the budgets of the Gulf countries or the U.S. or any of the uh, uh, traditional donor countries is actually a very tiny amount. So it's really a puzzle. You have this very sensitive area, you have this very sensitive uh, uh, problem developments uh, that actually threaten the stability of the PA, 
um, uh, a very high risk of another intifada, a very high risk of uh, extremist elements taking over. And yet, no dis- very little discussion, um, uh, no sense of urgency. And so this is a puzzle, and I think my colleagues will have a lot to say uh, on this, uh, mainly because it's basically a political, there are political factors, you know, the political factors here in the US today that are actually, um, that, that influence, uh, I think, this kind of complacency. I leave it to my colleagues to comment. I leave it as a question uh, to be discussed later. But anyway, we see that there is inaction. So why is there such inaction? Now, even if one were to say, well, it actually because of the political process, the political process is that what needs to be revived before us, before we could get re-engaged, before actually uh, um, uh, did it before uh, um, providing aid to the Palestinian Authority. Um, if we look back just uh, five years ago, 2007, we had also a fiscal crisis. Um, a fiscal crisis following a very deep political crisis. But if you remember in 2007, uh, Hamas uh, uh, took over Gaza and um, uh, the uh, West Bank and Gaza had just emerged from a period of severe financial sanctions. Uh, and so the international community realized that indeed the, the peace process is, uh, needs to be revived, but we cannot just sit there and do nothing. So something has to be done in a transitional period pending the resolution of the uh, political uh, problems that is pending some kind of agreement that could uh, lead to uh, either two-state solution or some permanent solution um, uh, that uh, that would uh, uh, allow the West Bank and Gaza to grow in a sustainable way. So what in 2007, there was a very important conference in December of 2007 in Paris uh, in which it was agreed that, well, even though we cannot resolve all the political issues today, what we can do is within the constraints, within these political constraints, given these political constraints, each of the parties uh, whose policies influence the development of Palestine and Gaza, and there are three parties that, that were um, uh, set out, um, and that First, of course, the Palestinian Authority, that is the main authority in charge of the policies of the West Bank and Gaza, but also uh, Israel, um, given that it, is, it has control over external trade and internal movement, and the donor community. Each of these parties will do its uh, utmost to support the development of the West Bank and Gaza in a transitional period pending the resolution of the political issues, pending um, the revival of the peace process. And so, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the Israeli action, there was a clear agenda for action which is focused on relaxing the restrictions to the maximum extent allowed by security considerations. At that time, uh, Israel had uh, control over uh, uh, invest the economic activity in Area C. But any activity in Area C had to have the approval of the Israeli authorities. Um, uh, that was one important impediment. But also uh, there was uh, there were severe impediments to movements within cities in the West Bank. And there were severe uh, restrictions on external trade, uh, both between the West Bank and Israel, and between Gaza and, uh, and the rest of the world. And so there was an agreement that Israel actually would relax those restrictions, not remove them, but relax them so as to allow a rebound in, uh, in, in the output of the West Bank and Gaza. The output had uh, been uh, severely compressed uh, during the um, uh, Hamas uh, period, during the period in which Hamas was in power, or had control, or had, uh, was leading the government. And so it was thought that simply by relaxing 
even modestly those relaxations, that would be the huge rebound in economic activity. And that would provide a uh, kind of a breathing space in a transitional period. It won't be, a, it won't be sustainable growth, but nevertheless it would be something that would last less than three years or so. Uh, the Persian Authority um, had committed to uh, strengthening its institutions, building institutions, improving governance, strengthening its public policy management system in such a way as so as to first uh, give confidence to private sector support, support private sector development, uh, but also uh, reduce its reliance on donor aid. And the IMF and World Bank laid out their own expectations uh, in terms of or benchmark in terms of what the, the, the present authority needs to achieve during the period 2008 to 2010. And the donor community, uh, for its part, uh, made a commitment, and there were actually concrete pledges, to support DPA in its efforts, in its reform efforts, and to um, uh, finance its uh, or cover its uh, uh, financing gap for these three years, 2015 to 2010. Well, of course, with understanding that the reliance would, de would, would decline during this, uh, those uh, three years. And so there was this very uh, comprehensive agenda for action as well, incorporated into the uh, Palestinian Reform Development Plan. Uh, and, um, and it was monitored by the IMF and World Bank. And uh, every six months, uh, uh, the donor representatives, Palestinians and Israelis, would meet with what's called the Advocacy Committee, class of which I referred to in September uh, 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 gathering. And an assessment would be made on how much progress uh, would be made. And on the basis of that, donors would actually uh, uh, commit to or disperse what has, what has been what has been said. Initially. Now, during this three-year uh, three period, uh, the results actually exceeded expectations. Uh, first, with regard to the Palestinian Authority benchmark, they have been all they were all met. Reliance on aid is really a reflection, or is, a, is an important indication of the extent of progress made on the institutional front. And just to give you a, a sense of how much progress was made in 2008. Um, about $1.8 billion was given from donors to the DA to cover, the, to, to cover its recurrent uh, budget deficit. In 2010, it went down to 1.1, so from 1.8 to 1.1. This far exceeded what the uh, IMF and World Bank had projected and had put as, as benchmarks. And this, is, this was a reflection of the progress made in institutional buildings. And of course, the uh, 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 in addition to just the, the quantitative aspect and the, 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 the financial aspect, the benchmarks on the structural measures uh, were also uh, met. Uh, and this, this is what allowed the IMF to actually uh, give its own appraisal uh, uh, to make an assessment that the DPA is ready to conduct uh, the sound economic policy expected of a huge and well functioning state. Um, in terms of the Israeli measures, and indeed, uh, the uh, restrictions that I have mentioned, um, although the ones that Israel viewed as uh, political security, uh, type of security, these were not, these were maintained. However, there was uh, a space of substantial easing of restrictions on movement within the West Bank. And also, uh, there was a um, relaxation of uh, controls of imports uh, of goods into Gaza, the consumer imports. Still, the export uh, ban was maintained, export ban on Gaza, uh, and uh, restrictions on the imports of investment goods to the private sector were maintained. Um, there was some relaxation of uh, uh, restrictions on external trade, but still, uh, there were important uh, uh, controls that were maintained that were viewed as type of security. For example, Palestinians cannot actually, Palestinian traders cannot go to Israel 
without a permit, and, this, and very few Palestinians can actually acquire that permit. Um, and nevertheless, within the uh, within the, the, the uh, given the expectations initially set, there was uh, a significant uh, a significant relaxation. Not enough to ensure sustainable growth. Not enough to provide a breathing space and to, to provide a pickup in uh, economic activity. Donors were also uh, they were able to uh, meet all their pledges and exceed actually the pledges made. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the financial aid from the donors not only uh, supported the reforms, enabled the reforms of the authority, but also provided an important stimulus to economic activity. So there was a pickup in uh, economic growth. Uh, economic growth average uh, GDP uh, grew by an average of uh, 7% a year during these three years. And um, that actually led to a lot of optimism. Uh, in 2009, Prime Minister Fayyad laid out a two-year plan, saying that in two years we will be ready for statehood, and, uh, and therefore uh, uh, this is the horizon that I have for uh, establishing the uh, state of Palestine that would, uh, be, uh, that, that would uh, live side by side with Israel. Um, however, in early 2011, um, there was a convergence of very unfortunate facts. First, donors, uh, donor aid became much lower than what, what, what was needed by DPA. Even though DPA budget continues to be, continues to contract, you know, the expenditures continue to decline, the share of GDP. And nevertheless, donor aid actually was, was much less than uh, required by DPA. The restriction of movement and access, um, uh, the easing of the restrictions slowed down considerably. Uh, and uh, uh, DPA had continued, continued to, to uh, develop its institutions, but there was really very little room uh, to, to, uh, to make progress uh, without uh, further relaxing restrictions on movement and access. So the question is the following: uh, How, you know, what, what is now the uh, uh, how can we move forward? Given the fact that we have an expire of this three-year agenda for action uh, and a uh, peace process that is that that is doesn't look as if it will be revised anytime soon. So one option is to have another Paris conference, another Paris. Uh, uh, meeting of these three parties and have another transitional phase that is, well, it's not realistic. Uh, <coughs> this conference would recognize that the political process needs time, but that in the meantime, uh, donors should be fully engaged and an economic crisis should be prevented. Israel should do its best again to relax as many restrictions as possible, even though the scope for a rebound is no longer there, but nevertheless, uh, 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 the parties would, would try to see what of the, which of the controls, for example, export export from Gaza or the use of the area key, which cover 50% of the uh, Palestinian uh, of the area of the West Bank, could be uh, relaxed. Um, or we could go straight with, with, to, to a permanent solution, which is to say a transitional, uh, transitional period is no longer realistic. So it is important to actually tackle the political issues up front and to try to uh, have to solve the economic issues at the same time as the political ones. So I leave with, with this kind of big question mark as the next step. And, uh, and, and my colleagues here would, uh, would actually uh, need to take into consideration, I think, the complexity now of trying to choose between these two sides. Thank you. Thank you, Sama, and thank you, Hussein, thank you, Kate, thank you, um, Lisa Institute, <coughs> for inviting me to be here. <coughs> 
just before I get started, uh, just a couple introductory remarks uh, in order to frame the discussion as I see it. Um, I, I think uh, Osama is absolutely right uh, as far as the, the peace process being dead. Uh, but before getting into that and maybe unpacking that a little bit, uh, I think it's important to distinguish between what we call the peace process and the two-state solution. Obviously, the peace process is a means to an end, uh, the end being a two-state solution. Uh, but very often, I think people conflate the two, and they assume that if the peace process is dead, that a two-state solution is dead. And I don't believe that uh, that's the case. I do believe that the peace process is in fact dead and it's not coming back and don't let anyone tell you that it is. If you hear talk about uh, impending negotiations, you should look the other way. It's not going to happen. And if it does happen, it's pure theatrics. It, it, certainly in the short term, short to medium term. Because the fundamentals uh, of the peace process have either collapsed or are in the process uh, of collapsing. And so it's not simply a matter of the parties getting back to the table. Um, and, and, and I think we need to we need to bear that in mind. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the collapse of the peace process does have serious implications for uh, the well-being or the possibility of a two-state solution. So, as I said, the two-state solution is not necessarily dead, but it is in fact dying, um, and dying uh, quite uh, slowly and, and painfully. Um, but it's not impossible to turn the clock back uh, at this stage, but it remains a purely theoretical proposition. Um, as far as the recent crisis, of course, I, I, I agree with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Osama, as well as the description of, uh, of Osama is probably the most knowledgeable person, um, certainly in this room, on, this, um, on the subject of, of the Palestinian economy and the state of uh, Palestinian institutions. Um, but I think, I think we have to sort of back up and look at this in a broader political context. If we go back to the protests that happened in September, we had about 10 days of uh, very intensive um, protests against the PA. Uh, those protests, they were dubbed the cost of living protests, and initially they were aimed at uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Salam Fayyad. But in, in reality, I think those protests were not really about Salam Fayyad, and they weren't really about um, uh, the cost of living. I mean, of course, those were the triggers. Um, but if you look at the trajectory of the demands of the protesters, um, you get a better picture of, of what, I, what I think the, the, these protests were really about. <coughs> what they're really about is uh, two fundamental and interconnected failures. Um, the failure of the peace process, as we already pointed, pointed out, but also the failure of the Palestinian leadership. And, and, and I agree with Hussein's description of, of uh, you know, obviously there's a financial crisis and there's a governance crisis, but there is a, actually a more fundamental crisis of legitimacy with regard to this Palestinian leadership. And, and the two crises, the two failures cannot be disentangled from one another. The failure uh, of the peace process and the failure of this Palestinian uh, leadership uh, that is based in Ramallah. Whether you call it the PLO, you call it the Palestinian Authority, you call it Fatah, they are all essentially have been conflated with one another um, and, and they are um, sort of uh, interchangeable. Um, <clears throat> and we've reached a point actually where, uh, uh, going back to, the, to, to why, I, why I think that, if you look at the trajectory of the demands of the, uh, the September protesters, they began by uh, calling for uh, Salam Fayyad's uh, resignation. Then it quickly turned into also Mahmoud Abbas's uh, resignation. Then it was, we want the cancellation of the Paris Protocol, uh, which is of course is the economic protocol, that, that uh, the Oslo era um, uh, protocol that governs the economic relations between the two sides uh, under Israeli occupation. And then it became Oslo uh, that was being demanded uh, to be dismantled uh, as well. Each sort of leading to the other uh, in succession, I mean, it may seem like an incoherent list of demands, but they're actually, um, as far as Palestinians are concerned, I think one and the same. When you, when you, when you realize that Salam Fayyad is prime minister, um, and, and you know these are terms that we have to use with a, with, with a certain amount of imagination and creativity, prime minister of a government with no state, um, and so this is where there are, you know. Um, uh, some of the fundamental contradictions of this peace process um, are, are coming into play. 
Um, there are really two reasons for, um, uh, well, before getting into that, the, the, I think we've reached the point where the, the needs of the quote unquote peace process, and by peace process I mean, you know, Oslo and all of its offspring, including the roadmap and the quartet and all of these institutions and mechanisms that have been set up as part of this Oslo framework, um, um, the, the, the peace process on the one hand and the legitimacy of Palestinian leaders on the other have essentially become mutually exclusive. Um, they've become, at a minimum, there is great tension between the two. Um, the, and, and I want to stress the peace process as it is now constructed under this, this Oslo framework um, is it is it has become impossible for the Palestinian leadership to engage in this quote unquote peace process without seriously eroding its own legitimacy. Um, and at the same time, we see a peace process that is uh, lending, uh, that is facilitating the occupation uh, in, in, in many respects. What are the reasons uh, for the current financial crisis? Well, um, it's very difficult to have an economy under, uh, uh, under occupation, as, as some have pointed out. Um, and it's also very difficult to have uh, a, a government, a Palestinian authority, uh, where donors don't pay. Um, and I would say those are the two main reasons, and we could argue about which is, uh, which is the, uh, the main reason. Um, but, uh, you know, let's, let's try to unpack those a little bit. You know, as I said, it's impossible to have a real functioning economy when, um, uh, whilst living under occupation. You have a situation where the government of Palestine does not control 60% of its territory, which means it doesn't have access to the resources. It cannot exploit the resources in 60% of its territory. It cannot develop those areas like any sovereign uh, normal uh, country would. Um, it doesn't control its borders. So import and export, of course, is a, is a function of the occupation. Um, it doesn't even control internal movement of, of people and goods. Um, that, again, also is subject to, is, is also a function of occupation. Um, and then on the second point about um, uh, the donors, obviously, you know, one of the great ironies of the peace process is that instead of working, building uh, towards Palestinian independence, uh, we actually have a situation where there's greater Palestinian dependence uh, on these foreign donors. So why are we here to talk about this the, the PA and the verge of class, mainly because the donors aren't paying. Um, and, and so that is, um, you know, that is a, an untenable situation, obviously, for a state in the making. Um, so let's try to unpack these a little bit. The peace process, why did it fail? I would argue it failed because uh, it was too imbalanced, uh, disjointed, and detached from reality um, to succeed. And we see that day in and day out. We look at this very fragmented Situation, and it is a function of this uh, of the peace process. Um, all you have to do is, um, uh, I mean, one perfect example, something that Osama pointed out: the World Bank and and other institutions have essentially have essentially um, uh, uh, you know accredited the Palestinians, or have, have they essentially said that the Palestinians have reached this threshold where they are now uh, uh, capable of uh, of, of, of being a, a fully functioning state. They, they pass the test, uh, in, in, in other words. And yet we don't see any connection between passing that threshold and, and actual political developments on the ground. Um, it was one thing when, uh, when uh, the, the Palestinian Authority was being punished when there was a great deal of violence happening, for example, in, two, in 2001 and 2002, um, but that's no longer the case. Um, and so there, there is no connection between meeting these benchmarks and these, these thresholds and graduating to actually becoming a state. Um, so again, you know, it's detached from reality. Um, but you also have this detachment from reality where, where Gaza and Hamas are treated as things that are sort of um, separate and distinct from this thing called the peace process. That somehow they can be, you can separate, you can take a state that is comprised of two entities two geographic entities um, and treat one completely differently than the other and expect that everything will come out okay in the end, that this will be a, a unitary, coherent Palestinian polity that is being created as opposed to a fragmented, disintegrated Palestinian polity. 
Um, and so the reality of the peace process is that it's actually not building Palestinian institutions. It is eroding Palestinian institutions. It is not building Palestinian independence. It is destroying Palestinian independence and in for reinforcing Palestinian dependence. Um, you look at, in terms of the imbalance, look at the treatment of the quote-unquote roadmap uh, and, the, and the quartet principles, the principles being the conditions that were placed on the elected government uh, after 2006 that was headed by Hamas, uh, um, uh, which, which essentially uh, imposed a set of financial sanctions on the, uh, on the Palestinian Authority if they did not meet these three uh, conditions. Uh, these, were, these were conditions decided by the UN, the US, uh, the, the European Union, uh, uh, and, and Russia. Um, they are not uh, enshrined in any uh, UN Security Council resolution. They are not binding in any meaningful sense. Um, uh, and, and yet they were applied as if they were, um, um, you know, uh, scripture or, or had the weight of a UN Security Council resolution. On the other hand, the roadmap, which is the official plan of this group called the Quartet, the same group that came up with the Quartet Principles, um, this, this was the official plan that is enshrined in a UN Security Council resolution. It's not necessarily binding in that sense, but it's in, it, is, it does have the endorsement of the Security Council. Um, it was completely abandoned. And it actually its components, things like a full freeze on settlement, uh, settlement activity, have been um, derided as utterly unworkable uh, and, and, uh, and misguided. And yet this, uh, this thing called the Quartet Principles has become, uh, has, has the weight of, uh, of bindingness. Um, the same is true of, of how the parties behave. Uh, the Israeli unilater unilateral disengagement plan, the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, was it expressly undertaken with the aim of destroying the roadmap, of, of, uh, of putting the two-state solution in quote-unquote formaldehyde. Uh, and delaying any uh, permanent status uh, arrangement between the two parties. And yet the Quartet and the international community rallied behind it um, and, and, and effectively endorsed it. Um, and with, you know, this was a unilateral um, Israeli uh, initiative. On the other hand, the, U the Palestinian unilateral uh, initiative to go to the United Nations, whether we think it's wise or not, how was that handled? Palestinians were punished. Uh, they were uh, sanctioned uh, by certainly by the United States and by, by Israel uh, and by others in, in, the, in the international community. What we have is a reality where the peace process, the price of admission to this ostensible peace process, but what is actually a failed process, is a permanent state of Palestinian division and weakness. Um, and we see that because this, the, when, when Palestinians have tried to undertake uh, something as fundamental as national unity, national reconciliation, uh, we find that they are sanctioned and punished by the international community. Uh, when they go to the UN, not to bypass negotiations, but to try and somehow enhance their negotiating position, they are sanctioned and punished uh, for doing so. So this is a function of the process. This is a process where you institutionalize Palestinian division and weakness. Um, and just to give you a sense of, uh, uh, of you know, the, the international community's relationship and certainly the United States' relationship with the Palestinian uh, leadership is, has gone well beyond uh, a client, uh, you know, a clientist type of relationship and into the realm of infantilization. And I just want to read you a quote from, uh, uh, from a State Department uh, spokeswoman uh, in February 2012 when she was asked about uh, the latest a reconciliation agreement between Hamas and Fatah. And she said, and I quote, what matters to us and what matters to the process that we are trying to keep on track here is that Abbas remains the president, that Fayyad remains the prime minister. So we're not going to speculate on what the effect might be, the effect of, uh, of this reconciliation. So this is in a moment where in the Arab world there's tremendous change and where the United States is encouraging governments to be more representative of their people. And here is the leader, or spokesperson for the leader of the most powerful uh, country in the world, essentially, um, essentially choosing the Palestinian leadership uh, for them. Um, so I think that it's important uh, to keep in mind. Um, and now, in terms of Palestinian uh, leadership, as I've said, you know, it's impossible to separate the failure of the peace process from 
the failure and, uh, and, and waning legitimacy of, uh, of the Palestinian leadership. Um, and if you look at the state of the Palestinian leadership, you find that, this, it, that it exactly mirrors the peace process, imbalanced, disjointed, and detached from reality. Um, all three pillars of, of legitimacy that the, the Palestinian leadership historically had relied on are either collapsed or in the process of collapsing. In terms of national liberation, in, in the old PLO days, it was armed struggle. Nowadays, it's uh, through negotiations. Those, obviously, uh, 20 years of negotiations have failed. Um, the second, to be representative of the Palestinian people, at least in some broad sense. Um, that also has, uh, has been done away with. The PLO used to represent the, the Palestinian diaspora and Palestinians inside their uh, historic homeland. Um, and after, of course, Oslo, and the PLO was hollowed out from within and, and transferred uh, into the Palestinian Authority, it effectively no longer uh, represented, uh, it still legally represents the, the refugees, but in a practical sense, it didn't. Um, and what we find, uh, uh, even, uh, uh, even today, the Palestinian uh, leadership uh, no longer controls Gaza. Uh, Hamas is not a member of the PA. So Gaza and the West Bank are, are, are split. So you used to have this leadership that represented all Palestinians everywhere, and today it's increasingly, then it became the West Bank and Gaza, now it's increasingly just the West Bank. Um, and that reality is being consolidated on a daily basis, even, I would argue, with the latest uh, local elections, which of course excluded Gaza and, and Jerusalem. So little by little, this leadership is becoming less representative. And then the third pillar of this Palestinian leadership uh, is in terms of delivering uh, services. Uh, in the past, it used to do it primarily through governance. Uh, the PLO had a very vast patronage network. Um, and, and, and today, it is, uh, 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 it, it is primarily through, uh, quote unquote, uh, governance since the creation of the PA. And this third element which is the one that we are now seeing. Uh, the third and final element is now uh, collapsing. And so what's needed, and I'll wrap up here uh, just a second, what's needed um, is, uh, uh, is essentially to let this failed process go. Uh, rule number one should be to do no harm. The, the United States and the international community should stop trying to engineer outcomes uh, in Palestinian politics. Um, uh, secondly, there is no such thing as state building. There's no amount of state building that can compensate for a lack of legitimacy in the Palestinian leadership. And so what Palestinians need was never, what Palestinians need was never uh, institution building, but consensus building. There ought to be a focus on that. Um, and, and lastly, the international community needs to work to actually end the occupation and not simply perpetuate a process that is in fact perpetuating the occupation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today with you uh, and to be speaking at a Middle East Institute uh, venue, uh, a place where I first uh, started learning Arabic over 20 years ago. Um, so maybe this is payback uh, a, a bit. Uh, it's also an honor to be on the panel with, uh, with uh, the colleagues that I've worked with in, in the past. Osama Kanan, I worked with very closely uh, in Jerusalem for over two years. Uh, Khalid al-Gindi, uh, back when he was working for the Palestinian Negotiating Unit, and I was in the, in the State Department and at the NSC, would come to Washington and, and uh, brief me regularly on, on the status of uh, settlement activity in the West Bank. Uh, and at the time, Khalid was probably the preeminent expert on every uh, settlement uh, activity that went on and could uh, explain it in, in intelligible uh, uh, terms, uh, given its complexity. And uh, Idish is, is, a, is a current uh, a colleague now in the world of the, the think tank world. Uh, it's also such a pleasure to see so many former colleagues and friends here in the audience. Um, I would not try to recognize all of you, but it's a pleasure to be here. There's all, though there is one I would like to recognize, and that's uh, Ambassador Phil Wilcox. Uh, Phil was a boss of mine a long time ago at the State Department and, and more importantly, a mentor. Uh, and uh, it meant a lot to me then and it has uh, endured and, uh, and not forgotten. So thank you, Phil. Um, 
I've been asked today to speak about the U.S. role vis-à-vis uh, -vis the current crisis and the steps that need to be taken. Uh, much of the analysis has been provided already by Osama uh, uh, and uh, by Khalid. Uh, and uh, also I'll try to speak uh, as briefly as possible. Uh, it is an economic uh, problem, crisis uh, that is uh, taking place. It is one uh, as as is described, uh, largely that of, uh, of a shortfall of, of donors. Um, uh, but it really is symptomatic of two larger fundamental problems, and those problems are really political and not economic. Uh, the first is, and here I think maybe, uh, it, maybe a terminology difference, maybe a fundamental difference, but um, I would argue that the first reason is that there's really no political process underway that is leading to a solution between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, part of that is no real negotiations, no real end uh, in sight to the occupation. Um, so as one byproduct of that, Arab donors are not paying their contributions to the Palestinian budget. Uh, one reason is because they have no lack, uh, there's a, a lack of faith in the future. They don't want to be seen to be underwriting the occupation. Uh, and so in the absence of an of a, of a end of the occupation in sight, they don't want to be seen as lessening that burden that they see as really Israel's responsibility. And second, it must be said that the part of it is also punitive. It has to do with certain personal relationships and poor personal relationships between uh, Palestinian leaders and uh, leaders in the Arab world. Uh, I won't get too in into that. It's, uh, it's not a pretty picture, but it's, it, it exists. A second component of it, it has to do with uh, Israel's behavior uh, on the ground, uh, not taking the fundamental measures that would really allow the Palestinian economy to open up and flourish in the way that Osama described. Uh, uh, I was there, I suppose, for the halcyon days in which we did see the effect and the, the proof of concept that when uh, barriers to, uh, to movement are, are moved, are, uh, uh, then the Palestinian economy can flourish and Palestinian talent uh, and innovation uh, flourishes and the economy uh, flourishes as a result. Um, so allowing Palestinians to take control and, um, uh, does work, uh, more so than infusions of cash and other uh, outside uh, uh, assistance. Now today's situation in a sense is kind of ironic because throughout the course of the peace process, usually the case was that negotiations outpaced developments on the ground. Throughout the 90s, one of the fundamental reasons for the undermining of the peace process was as negotiators were making progress uh, uh, on, in discussions, um, although I'm sure we will uh, uh, debate this a bit, uh, on the ground the situation was getting worse. And so in the period between, let's say, Oslo in 1993 and uh, the Camp David negotiations in 2000, the life for Israelis and Palestinians got worse, even though politically this, uh, the two uh, were engaged in intensive negotiations to try to end the conflict. Now today the conditions are different. In that period as described by Osama, uh, conditions vastly improved on the ground, but there has been no peace process or no process to support it. And over time, you know, sort of like a roadrunner, uh, when he finally gets realizes that he's uh, uh, standing on no ground, it starts to collapse. And this situation is particularly quizzical, given the behavior of this administration, one that I did work for. In May of 2011, President Obama made a very important speech at the State Department. It was originally designed to be the American response to the uh, uprisings going on throughout the Arab world, but he then pivoted to talk about uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues. And the President outlined his vision for what would be a, a deal or a, a settlement, uh, at least the, the beginning of a process, uh, based on uh, uh, borders and security. And he outlined some principles on which uh, such an agreement could be based. But oddly, and I don't understand it to this day, um, rather than then uh, intensifying uh, American peacemaking efforts, uh, there was no follow-up. Uh, the president stepped back and in essence uh, called on the sides to engage and sort it out amongst themselves. Uh, they didn't. Uh, other parties attempted to step into the breach, uh, the Jordanians, uh, the Quartet, uh, others, and have managed to keep some modicum of, of contact alive. And um, the fact that there is no uh, violence taking place today of consequence is no accident. 
uh, as I like to say, it takes a lot of work sometimes just to make nothing bad happen. And so uh, to those who actually think that the situation on the ground today is happening just by happenstance, it actually is the product of a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on uh, between Israelis and Palestinians, between international diplomats quietly working uh, uh, in very unglamorous uh, uh, circumstances to just keep the situation from deteriorating further. Uh, so we are have been, have been in, a con uh, in a period of conflict management and not conflict uh, resolution. But the second reason for the situation we're in, and it was alluded to and discussed uh, uh, earlier, is the decision by the Palestinian leadership, uh, led by Mahmoud Abbas, to pursue Palestinian statehood uh, last year uh, at the Security Council. Um, as Khaled rightly pointed out, the, uh, that effort was described by uh, Abu Mazen, President Abbas, as an effort to gain leverage in negotiations, uh, and it did precipitate uh, uh, American opposition. Uh, and this has led to uh, the American withholding of, of the $200 million, as, as Osama mentioned. Uh, it has led to a situation in which the situation will only get worse if indeed that um, uh, the Palestinians do return to the UN uh, in the General Assembly uh, next month. Uh, there's legislation in place that would uh, prohibit uh, economic support funds from going to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and so we've been in a situation in which the US and the Palestinians have been locked in, in a very uneasy situation in which there has been both cooperation and collaboration on the one hand, collaboration in the positive sense of the word, uh, but also competition and indeed confrontation. And we are now in a situation in which really the U.S. and the Palestinian Authority can't decide if they're really partners or adversaries, or both. Uh, at a minimum, there's no shared strategy of a way forward. Um, indeed, I would argue we've been in a position of drift. So the question really is, what is to be done? Um, first of all, I would submit that when, after November 6th uh, and our elections, President of the United States was going to have to make a very difficult decision. President Obama, when he took office in 2008, determined the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to be a key national interest, and within a week appointed uh, Senator George Mitchell as his envoy, and clearly wanted to devote high-level political attention to solving this issue. Um, the question before the President, whomever that will be, is, is that going to be the U.S. approach now? And in all candor, that's going to be a very difficult call for the president. Um, why undertake a process that has such a, a poor prospect of success? Uh, it's not clear who your partners are. Uh, we're entering a period of Israeli elections. The region itself is going through a major transition. Uh, and so why put political capital into a process that has a very poor chance, or at least uh, not a very clear chance of success? And yet, not to engage uh, could also precipitate an even uglier scenario. And one could easily envisage a situation in which the Palestinians go to the General Assembly in November, attain uh, 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 non-state uh, membership, uh, punitive actions then are triggered, uh, uh, or, or punitive uh, reaction is then uh, triggered by Israel. The situation deteriorates further, the economy gets worse, and indeed then violence and conflict on the ground returns. So that's the choice before the president. If the president decides to engage, then a question that has to be addressed is what strategy is needed? And here, I think we have to learn from some of our mistakes. I'd argue that what is needed is really a new conceptual approach to this issue of Middle East peace, one that takes into account the realities of both the economics of the Palestine um, as well as the politics, and to recognize that the two are inextricably interwoven, and that you cannot treat them as distinct and discrete issues. Politics uh, and economics are intermingled. The approach of the previous administration through this one has been to treat them as discrete issues. The United States has tended to focus on negotiations and wanted to then outsource economic development um, to institutions such as the World Bank, the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee, uh, the Office of the Quartet Representative, uh, what have you. Um, this has led to a very uh, a lack of integration in the approach and has inadvertently sent the message that what happens on the ground is actually less important than what happens in negotiations. 
and it's led to a situation where the, the, the positive developments on the ground do not support the, um, the negotiations when they do happen. So at the heart of it, I, I agree with much that Khalid said, Israelis and Palestinians have lost faith in the prospect of peace. Uh, but the reason that is because of the gap between what has happened on the ground and what has happened in the negotiations. And at this point, I think both sides have come to the conclusion, at least at the leadership level, that negotiations are not worth the price of, of engaging in them. So what I'm suggesting is not really adding more to the to-do list for senior leaders. They have enough to do. It's really about engaging in a way in which you integrate the issues on the ground, settlements, economic development, security, into the negotiations. It means you can't defer the, the movement on the ground, lifting the burden of the occupation uh, until the end of negotiations. This has always been the problem. Uh, the argument has been leaders can't um, have X amount of political capital and they can only deploy it in a certain way and so they should hold off in taking actions on the ground until uh, uh, because they need that political capital to sell a deal. The problem is by the time they get to the deal, there's no confidence in the deal and therefore the deal is not attainable. And that's why it has to be integrated. Anecdotally, just before I left Jerusalem in 2010, I had a farewell call of, uh, uh, in the office of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's office and I, I took one of his uh, key aides aside and I said, you know, when you came into office in 2008, you promised all sorts of steps on the ground and we spent hours going over the kinds of things you were going to do uh, to, uh, to improve the situation on the ground. Um, and you really understood it, you got it. Uh, why didn't it happen? And he was very candid with me and I appreciated it. He said, the reason is because no one really asked. He said, the problem was we weren't going to get any credit for it, and so we were only going to do things that we were going to get credit for. And if the Americans had asked for it, then it would have been a different discussion. And I think that's, uh, that's informed my thinking, and I think it has to inform American thinking in the future. Now, for more than two decades, maybe three, I've been hearing officials and uh, analysts arguing that time is running out on the two-state solution. And I've been skeptical until recently. But I have to say now that I've actually come to embrace that view um, and I've been struck at how many people who, uh, who on the ground who share that view, people from not only the Israeli left but even the Israeli center and indeed the what I would call the moderate right now believe that time is running out and that only a few years are left before uh, the situation becomes uh, in capable of being changed. We're drifting towards a situation, I would argue, in which the partition between uh, the land, between the Mediterranean and the River Jordan cannot be effectuated. The solution that basically has been on the table since 1937 uh, in some shape, way, shape or form uh, in various ways. At the end of the day, there is no one-state solution. There's a one-state outcome, but I think that's a prescription for continued conflict and confrontation. What is needed is a vision, really, for Israelis and Palestinians both to embrace. Now, Khalid has said that the peace process is dead. That may be, although I, I note uh, comments from one uh, senior Israeli leader once said to me that in the Middle East there's dead, there's dead and buried, and there's dead and buried and never coming back. <laughs> so I hope that we're at a situation where the peace process is only dead. Um, and I would just point to one reality. In the years 2001-2002, in the height of the Intifada, when thousands of Palestinians and Israelis were killed, and trust was destroyed between the two, it then appeared that really the peace process was dead. And yet somehow, through active diplomacy, tenacity, um, hard efforts, the parties were brought back together and by all accounts, serious negotiations reconstituted and a more forthcoming deal 
uh, was put forward, at least one that Mahmoud Abbas today says he would like to return to, the one put forward by Prime Minister Omar in 2008. The point is that despite what looked like a, 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 a complete dead end, the, the peace process was resuscitated. And so, therefore, I would just uh, caution against despair and declaring the situation um, irretrievable because declaring it and, may, and uh, deciding that it is so is self-fulfilling. I'll leave the rest for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. You left out better than a dead dodo. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I'm going to start the question and answer with, with a, a question for the whole panel, and then I'll come to you, and we'll, we'll move on. Uh, but I'd, li I'd like to break it into two parts um, uh, for Osama's opening remarks uh, between the economic and the political. Uh, so for uh, all the panelists, I'd like to ask what, if anything, could the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah do proactively, unilaterally, to uh, make the situation better, for the, to start to fix the situation as things are, I mean, without, without anybody else doing it? What could they do, if anything? Is there anything they could do? I'd like Osama to address the question economically. And uh, I'd ask uh, Khalid and or Rob if they'd like to comment about that politically. I mean, no is a perfectly okay answer, if that's the truth. Um, I think in my remarks I uh, did not emphasize some of the positive things that were done jointly, uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis working together uh, at the technical level. Now, at the high Policy level, there are you know, fundamental disagreements, and things have been progress has been very slow. But at the technical level, just to give you an example, for example, the, the uh, clearance revenue that is collected by Israel on behalf of the PA constitutes about 70 percent of total budget revenue of the PA. Now, over the past uh, three years or so, uh, there have been regular meetings. Between the Minister of Finance, the people at the Minister of Finance of Israel, with, with those in, um, uh, in Ramallah. Uh, and enormous progress was achieved in, in uh, preparing a package of measures that would uh, increase the efficiency of the, of the collection of, uh, of this revenue. And uh, recently, the um, policymakers in Israel were so impressed with the progress made at the technical level that they had no other choice but to uh, give the green light. Now things are still very slow and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the results are, are not yet, uh, have not seen tangible results. But nevertheless, it's an illustration of the, the uh, uh, effort the, of, of, of uh, the, the, the uh, progress that can be made by both sides working. Is similarly, for example, the Central Bank of uh, Israel uh, has been working with the PMA uh, in um, uh, supporting uh, the banking uh, sector, uh, supporting the good relations, good relationship between the banks in Israel and those in, in the Palestinian uh, territories. Uh, so this is just to actually emphasize that even within these political constraints and within, even given uh, the lack of uh, progress on the political front, um, a great deal can be achieved by the Palestinian Authority uh, in uh, improving the, the situation. And of course, uh, this has, this cannot be lead to any sustainable improvement in, in the situation on the ground. It could actually raise revenue, it could improve the, uh, the fiscal situation of the PA. This is one area. Uh, the other is, um, really the, the uh, uh, efforts that have to be made um, to uh, continue to improve the efficiency of expenditure, to target them to, the, to those who, who really need, uh, to the truly needy. And the Palestinian has established a social safety net that actually ensures that um, there is as little waste as possible regarding uh, the support uh, given to the uh, population. And so uh, I would say um, you know, the, the, uh, on the economic area, in the economic area, even though there has to be really uh, a major effort done by donors and by the Israelis at the, at the high end level policy, 
at the, at the high policy level. Nevertheless, I think there's a great deal of actions that can be done uh, to uh, to really prevent a crisis. It's not to solve the, the uh, or, or to, as uh, Robert has, uh, has mentioned, not to re to, to uh, resolve uh, the crisis, but try to manage it better. So it's really crisis management, better crisis management that is. Uh, thanks. Uh, would either of you, Khalid uh, or Rob, like to address the question of what policies can do politically? Uh, yes, I do, I, and, and I would thank you for introducing the element of Palestinian agency, which is uh, so lacking these days. Um, uh, but it's essential that Palestinians uh, not rely on the Quartet and the United States and the international community, uh, who will only, um, uh, I think, because they have so many sunken costs in this failed process, they're not prepared. To sort of to scrap it and say, you know what? I think we've been doing this all along. That there has to be a measure of Palestinian agency, regardless of that. Um, I think the first thing that Palestinians have to do politically is to fix their own house. I, I don't know of any nation, uh, occupied or otherwise, that ever liberated themselves uh, at a moment when they were divided right down the middle, uh, geographically, politically, factionally. Um, Diplomatically, uh, it just—I've uh, I, never seen such a such a creature in history. If someone knows of such an example, uh, I would love to know about it. Um, so I think that's the most important thing that, that Palestinians can do, because even if even if all the stars align, if the politics are just right in Israel, just the perfect coalition and exactly the right person in the White House with exactly the right Secretary of State and exactly the right mood on Capitol Hill, and you get this agreement. This leadership can't implement it, and frankly, doesn't have the legitimacy, doesn't have the mandate to negotiate uh, for it in the first place. Because who exactly do they represent? How can this leadership be said to represent, to negotiate issues like refugees, um, when uh, they clearly, nobody, nobody from the refugee or the Palestinian diaspora uh, community ever elected them? So that much less uh, folks in Gaza or Jerusalem or, uh, I mean, you, you know, we have this constantly narrowing scope. Uh, and so things may be doing very, very well in some relative sense um, in this constantly narrowing scope. And pretty soon we'll be talking about the, fin the, the, the fantastic relations between Area A uh, and Israel. And what a wonderful thing, all these institutions that we built in Area A. But we're talking about national institutions. So banking sector reforms and you know all of the <coughs> institutional building reforms are essentially meaningless when you discount 40% of the population uh, from that equation. Rob? Um, thank you. Uh, I mentioned how I thought the United States had to make uh, a very fundamental choice and I think in many ways the Palestinian leadership does as well. Um, I agree with the, what Khalid said. I, I think I would frame it slightly differently. I think, first of all, uh, ultimately, the Palestinian leadership needs to decide upon a strategy because right now it's pursuing a number of strategies that are in conflict with one another. And in many ways, I think it needs to pick one. Um, and whatever strategy it picks will be imperfect and will have uh, real costs. Uh, but whether it be to go for statehood in the UN, to pursue negotiations with Israel, to pursue reconciliation between the divided factions, to pursue elections. All these are different avenues that need to be considered and all ultimately need to be pursued. They can't be pursued in parallel, but try and trying to do so ultimately leads to paralysis, and that's where we are today. Uh, so I think ultimately a decision needs to be taken about the way forward. Uh, I would take slight issue with the issue of one thing, Hav, that you, you said. I mean, the PLO was determined, I thought, by the Palestinian uh, fiat and uh, as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and recognized by the Arab world and ultimately the international community as such um, in, in the 1970s. And we have had elections, and there probably is a need for further elections to the, to the PLO and the PNC uh, as a result. But there are mechanisms in place. So I, I agree with you on the need for re-legitimization, but to, to argue that it has no legitimacy whatsoever, I think, maybe goes a little tight. I didn't know 
rapidly waning. Okay. <laughs> and and that, of course, begs the question on whose terms. Uh, but we can come to that later. Uh, let's begin turning it over to you. Uh, I see a few hands. We'll begin with, uh, we'll go down to here, and we'll switch there, and then we'll go to the back there. But there's a microphone. Uh, please uh, identify yourself briefly and uh, a question. Not, we'll yes. enter, we will only answer okay. questions. Uh, my name's Herbert Grossman. I'm a retired judge. Mm -hmm. uh, when Israel took over the uh, West Bank in Gaza in 1967, the standard of living there was approximately what it was in Jordan and in uh, neighboring Egypt. Sorry. Uh, by the time uh, 2000 came around, the standard of living was about three times higher in uh, the West Bank and Gaza than it was in the neighboring countries. The literacy rate had gone from 20% to over 90%. And the reason is the people there were tied to the Jewish economy, the Israeli economy. There were 150,000 people working in Israel from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip every day going into Israel. They had shops and restaurants in the West Bank that people from Israel were visiting and were patrons of. With the Intifada and the suicide bombings, uh, the Palestinians decided to cut themselves off from that. Uh, and so uh, all of that uh, economy vanished. Now, there isn't a single Arab country without natural resources that is in, in which the people are living above the poverty level. There's no reason to believe that without being tied to the Israeli economy, which I don't recommend for Israel at all, that the Arabs in, in uh, the West Bank of Gaza should be living any higher now than the Arabs in the, gov in, in the neighboring states uh, and, and, and so when you talk about getting a, a whole state and that the Arabs are going to be prosperous and, and, and develop their resources, there are no resources. We have your question. So I, I the, answer, the question it. is, why do you call it a crisis? It seems to be that the Arabs are, are getting to, to where they would be without all the international aid. Yeah, we, we do have your point. And, okay. and I try not. Thank you. And, uh, well, um, the IMF uh, staff has undertaken a uh, very detailed study uh, of uh, economic, economic development over the past 20 years. And it shows clearly that uh, since the imposition of restrictions on trade and movement, there has been a very severe decline in living standards in the West Bank and Gaza. And it's only in 2009 that the West Bank and Gaza regained its per capita income that we read in 1994. Uh, and, and of course, uh, when you look at as, uh, an economy as small as the West Bank and Gaza, um, the empirical evidence shows that uh, economies with, with a small domestic market, such as the one in the West Bank and Gaza, cannot grow sustainably without uh, having a, uh, a vibrant export sector. And the restrictions that Israel has imposed on exports have been severe. There's an export, but there has been an export ban on, uh, uh, on Gaza. The West Bank exports only recently have started to be relaxed, but still, uh, the Palestinians are not allowed to have an airport. Uh, they're, they're not allowed to have a seaport. The access to third markets uh, is, is very, very uh, uh, restricted. And so uh, the, the, the policies uh, that have been implemented by Israel have severely hampered the economic development uh, in the West Bank. <coughs> and I'm sure Robert would have uh, more If either of you would like, uh, briefly. Very briefly, I, I mean, two words. I mean, it's the occupation. Uh, I mean, the reality is that from 1967 on, Israel tried a number of different measures and initiatives to try to improve the standard of living of Palestinians <coughs> with an eye towards essentially saying if your living standard got better then you would become fat and happy and basically be um, re uh, not restive. As the first intifada showed in 1988, that, uh, that effort was not viable because it didn't address the po political aspirations of the Palestinians. And so whether the political crisis we're talking about today is a result of the Palestinian institutions that have been created as a result of Oslo as transitional institutions 
now not being able to fulfill their duties and mandates. That's the crisis we're talking about today. But to suggest that Palestinians can be um, essentially have their political aspirations met through improved standard of living, I think, is, is has been proven uh, since 1967 to be fallacious. Uh, we'll have a question here from Howard Zilka, and then we'll shift over here to the lady in red. Um, Howard Sumka used to be the USA director in West Bank, Gaza, and was for a while the CEO of the One Voice Movement. Um, I was very happy to hear you say, Rob, that, um, that, that the financial crisis is a derivative crisis, that it's really rooted in political problems, because I think we've all been saying that for a long time. I mean, the World Bank, in all of the uh, AHLC reports it did, talked to praise the Palestinian economy and then talked about the constraints of the occupation, putting a ceiling on what could what could be accomplished, and and uh, decrying the fact that there was no political process going alongside it. So I, I have actually three very quick questions, okay. uh, not all for you, Rob. One, I thought we did actually, I'm taking a little issue with what you said, a pretty good job of integrating on the ground economic development institution building work with the political process between USAID and the embassy and the consulate and the quartet and so on. We were together a lot on a, on a lot of issues. And so my question is how could we have done it better or how could we now uh, do it better? Secondly, uh, I, I very strongly believe sort of uh, following from your comment about it's the occupation, um, that there are things that Israel should have been doing and can be doing at least to test the proposition that the Palestinians are ready to be partners at the table, and instead we get a lot of actions from Israel that tell the Palestinians we're not interested in, 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 in dealing with you. What could be done uh, to push Israel a bit on this, and, and with Israel the kind of political issue it is right now in the campaign, let's say what could be done on November 7th uh, or, November, or January 20th. Uh, and finally, the issue of Gaza and the West Bank. We have all, I think, held the fiction for a long time that Palestine is Gaza and the West Bank and we need unification and we can't do anything until we get unification. But I don't think unification is coming anytime soon. We see no, no hope of that for all sorts of reasons. So the question is, with the, with, the, with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah spending half of its budget to support civil servants who don't work in Gaza and then coming to the donor community and saying we can't pay salaries is, is, is a little bit puzzling to say the least and I think it, it, that kind of complaint lands on very deaf ears in the Congress and it's part of the problem. What could be done to sort that? Got it. Three questions, three panelists. Who goes first? <laughs> Rob, go uh, first. Howard, uh, I take your point, uh, uh, and no disrespect uh, was intended towards USAID or any of the efforts that we undertook uh, uh, to integrate at the working level on the ground. What I was talking about was really at the high politics level. Um, that when it really came, comes to it, when we're talking about presidential level involvement, Secretary of State at that level, what we saw has been a focus on negotiations almost exclusively. So, for an example, as a practical matter, when a Secretary of State comes to the region, um, or President's envoy, uh, Secretary Mitchell or Senator Mitchell, uh, what I would propose is instead of going and meeting with three Israelis, three Palestinians, and then going home, uh, actually going out visiting the USAID project, actually drawing attention to the fact that what is happening on the ground is as important as what happens in those negotiation, negotiating room. Um, those sort of actions send a very strong and potent message about what matters and what doesn't. And so it's at that level that I think there's been a real um, failure uh, uh, and, and where I think we have to do a lot more. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, we should address the other two questions. We are running quick. We are lo running long time. That's so concise. Yes. Uh, yeah. On the question, uh, uh, on the question of, of uh, Gaza and the West Bank, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, Howard. I, I couldn't possibly disagree uh, more uh, strongly. I, 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 and I, you know, yeah, sorry to sort of put it in these terms, but I think that's the sort of thinking that got us into this mess. It's it's, it's the notion that. 
you know, we've got these very rigid requirements on the Palestinians. You know, like I said, we've infantilized them. We've chosen exactly who their leaders should and shouldn't be. Um, never mind the outcome of your elections. These are the two individuals who must be, <coughs> which is a very incongruent concept in this environment of, uh, of, the, of the Arab Spring, uh, in any context, but, but especially now. Um, and and this, this notion of, you know, instead of adjusting the process, instead, instead of adjusting the flaws in the process to accommodate Palestinian politics and Palestinian needs, we have to impose greater, we have to turn the, turn the tables and, and impose that uh, requirement on the Palestinians. No, it's you, who, you Palestinians, have to adapt to the needs of this process, which are ultimately based on the needs uh, uh, of uh, American politics and Israeli politics, um, but, but not really on the needs of, of Palestinian politics. And I think moving in that direction will on, is only, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I think it's a logical conclusion to come to given the trajectory we've been on. But what I'm arguing is to change that trajectory, to take this process that is moving us entirely in the wrong direction and move in a different direction, to rethink it completely instead of deepening the problem. Okay, thanks. Uh, Osama, do you have uh, anything to add on any of those Okay, well, let's go with this lady in the red shirt here. And um, hands up everybody else, right? So I'll go all the way to the back next step. Um, Allison, good. I'm a master's candidate in Middle East Studies at the LA School, um, right up the street. And I recently read that the United States for the fiscal year 2013 is going to restructure its aid to the Palestinians so that more money goes to, um, I guess, municipalities instead of the um, overall PA apparatus itself. And I was wondering if you all think that this is a sign that the United States no longer sees the Palestinian Authority as a fiscally or politically viable um, body. Okay, good question. Anybody? Some? If we go back to uh, 2006, when Hamas was in charge of the, was leading the government, uh, there was an international boycott, and the financing bypassed the single treasury account. So the best practices that are usually applied, um, uh, best public finance practices that are usually applied did not actually hold at that time, precisely because of the boycott. And that was extremely damaging uh, to the public financial management system. Uh, to for transparency. The best, according to best practices, the money has to go through a single, a single treasury account uh, that is um, uh, uh, covered by the uh, Palestinian Authority, by the state in charge or the authority in charge. And the U.S. has been actually, uh, and other countries have been uh, following these best practices. Uh, the money that has been um, going to the um, uh, Palestinian Authority has all been channeled through the single treasury account. So uh, I hope that, you know, uh, uh, the, this practice continues because otherwise you will have a situation where transparency is adversely affected. We need to uh, have, we continue to have, it's important to continue to have full transparency uh, where um, uh, the uh, uh, budget uh, reports can be accessed by the average, by, by the, by the uh, citizen of the West Bank and Gaza through the, for example, the, uh, the internet. Right now you can go to the website and see all the expenditures and revenues and financing items um, uh, on the website, in the, on the website of the Minister of Finance. And so that is really to uh, a maximum transparency and, and, to, and, to, and to ensure that this money can be traced uh, and be audited properly. Okay, we'll go all the way into the back. There's a gentleman with a beard in the last row. We'll go to him. Just try to move around too graphically. Thank you. Uh, Quickly, please. Thank you guys for being here. It's an honor to hear from scholars like you. Uh, my name is Walid. I'm an international student from the Hesha Refugee Camp in Bethlehem. Uh, my question for all of you. First, uh, there is, uh, talking about the foreign aid to the Palestinians, uh, recently I heard that there is more than 40,000 NGOs <coughs> in the Palestinian territories. Uh, there's a lot of Palestinian work with these NGOs, and most of them have a political or religious agenda. Do you think these poisoned agenda that they offer to the Palestinians are a problem for the Palestinians, or these funds that they help, is it helping the Palestinians, or is it a problem in the Palestinian territories? And the other question is about the legitimacy of the PLO. Um, we, as we know, the PLO is not, uh, uh, is not 
you know, taking part in the, a lot of Palestinian territories, do you think there is an effect of visit from the Qatar, uh, the, the king of Qatar to the mm -hmm. Gaza, would be any effect in the PLO? Okay, well, let, let's begin with the question of NGOs. Anybody want to address the role of NGOs, the effect of NGOs? Or shall we just let it stand as a comment? Okay, then, so the question is a very interesting question. What about the visit of the Emir of Qatar to uh, Gaza and $400 million uh, allegedly arriving <coughs> in Gaza at a time when the government of Ramallah is completely starved? What, what's, what's the impact and effect of that? What are we to make of an international situation which produces that? <laughs> well, well, I think, I, you know, here we are. You know, it, whether or not we like it, there, there is a lead, there is a not just a leadership crisis. There is a legitimacy crisis, and of course, sources of legitimacy flow from from different uh, sources. But um, uh, you know, an international recognition is one of them. You know, the fact that the PLO has, however many, <coughs> 140, how many, what it is that the number is these days. Um, the vast majority of nation states in the world recognize the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Um, but we're starting to see that international consensus break. And it's only logical when you have a competing authority uh, in the West Bank. And that has an electoral claim to legitimacy on some level. Of course, their term has expired and so on and so forth. But they too, of course, have only partial legitimacy. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. You know, it, it, neither the West Bank kind of truncated uh, authority uh, nor the Gaza Hamas ruled uh, authority uh, have really full legitimacy. Neither can claim to be fully representative. Neither can claim to be uh, uh, to have their their program uh, claimed as a as a resounding success. Um, and neither can claim to be governing in a way that is satisfactory to the majority of their people. Um, and so. That's what we have. We have a broken system, and so the idea is that you need to put it back together. And you don't just try to fix one piece of it and hope that it will uh, somehow um, uh, infect the rest. I mean, the reality is that Hamas is not a member of the PLO, and that's a problem. When a group wins an election and it is not part of this umbrella, then you have a challenge to le the legitimacy of that group. That is a legitimate question to pose. Um, and, and, and the fact that you have international recognition for some aspect of that deepens that problem. Yeah, and then it come, brings me back to my question, which I don't expect an answer to, on whose terms. Uh, we have time for one more question, very quickly. I'll, uh, I'll just note, no, uh, uh, go just ahead. Uh, Dakota, my understanding is that the trip uh, was aborted uh, uh, prematurely, and so uh, I've I heard think, that too. Uh, uh, the, the story about this visit uh, has yet to be told, and it no doubt will be an interesting one. I agree, I agree. We have time for one more quick question, and it'll be you. The lady in the sort of yellowish green sweater. Hi, uh, my name is Gabby Chapolsky. I'm from the University of California, San Diego. I'm on a program here in DC, and my question is, what is the status of the PA financial reserve? Where is it? What, what's its status? Okay. Okay. That'll be for some. Okay. Um, it's a great question, Edward. Yeah. So, you mentioned this up. I, I would say that is a huge, the PA has a function, a huge debt um, in, two, in two respects. One is debt to the uh, commercial banking system, and that's about a billion dollars, which is about 10% of GDP. And more importantly, uh, debt to the private sector suppliers of goods and services. That is, because of the uh, liquidity crisis, because of the lack of the cap of cash, uh, DPA has been, in effect, uh, uh, purchasing goods and services from the private sector without paying for them by the uh, through what's called domestic payment arrears. So it uh, doesn't have reserves, it doesn't use that. And uh, there's very little scope to actually borrow more from either private sector or from commercial banks. Uh, it has been uh, respecting the limits, uh, the DPA has been respecting the limits imposed by banks on lending, so there's no uh, danger to the bank. But uh, there is uh, little scope to actually continue to uh, finance its deficit by not paying the private sector. And this is why. Uh, Currently, the only way out, the only way it, could, it can manage its finances is by not paying its workers. 
So uh, we have really a uh, very quality, qualitative uh, change in the way the EA uh, can manage its finances. So one where the payments uh, are, uh, are not made to the private sector, to the one where even the basic services are being cut and, and, and even its own workforce is not getting paid. Um, so this is the answer question. I would like also to just mention a few words about this kind of priority, prioritization of where, where the cash should go, the PA or, or directly uh, for to finance investment in Gaza. Uh, a very large part of uh, the PA budget is actually spent in Gaza. Um, 50,000 uh, workers, out of 100,000 workers are in Gaza. And these payments to the Gaza workers, the Gaza employees from DPA, from Ramallah, really serves also as a social safety net. In a, in a situation where Gaza's reach to be per capita today, today is 10% below that uh, that we had in 1994, uh, these payments are essential. Now, of course, uh, there are also restrictions uh, imposed by uh, Israel on uh, public investments that are not supervised by international organizations. And so any money also that goes to, uh, to, uh, to finance uh, public investment has an important impact. But, I, but it's important to actually also bear in mind that by not giving money to the PA, Gaza is, is also adversely affected. The welfare of its own inhabitants is, is adversely affected. Okay, thanks very much. Well, so thanks very much to you all for coming, and thanks to Osama Khan and for coming.